live in a world of many conflicts. We may not face danger or violence in our everyday lives, but we can't help knowing about many people who do. And sometimes, maybe through an act of terrorism or the plight of refugees, these dangers come much closer to home. What do we expect our leaders to do in these situations? And how do we respond personally? What if our government commanded us to do the fighting? A hundred years ago, for the first time, that's exactly what the government did. They commanded us to do the fighting. The sheer scale of the casualties meant that volunteers were just not enough. But compulsion was not something that everyone was willing to accept. We are all young men, and life is a precious thing to such men. We cherish life because of the opportunities for adventure and achievement which it offers to a man who is young. They say our country is in danger. Of course it is. But whose fault is that? It will be in danger in 50 years' time if our rulers know they can always win our support by hoisting danger signals. They will never heed our condemnation of their foreign policy if they can always depend upon our support in time of war. There is one interference with individual judgment that no state in the world has any sanction to enforce. That is, to tamper with the unfettered free right of every man to decide for himself the issue of life and death. This is Devonshire Row, just off Bishopsgate in central London, a hundred years after those words were spoken. At that time, it was the old headquarters of the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers. It was a rambling complex of passageways, offices and meeting halls and a courtyard. And in April 1916, it was the venue for an extraordinary gathering of 2,000 people. Almost all of them were young men, determined to defy the command of their government to fight for king and country in the Great War. The time and venue of the meeting had been reported in patriotic newspapers and a hostile crowd had gathered around the building. A few police officers were on duty, but it's unlikely that protecting pacifists was high on their list of priorities. Those inside Devonshire House were members of the No Conscription Fellowship, an organisation formed soon after the war began to campaign against any proposal for compulsory military service. By early 1916, its first battle and founding raison d'etre had already been lost. The war was well into a second terrible year with crippling casualties and no end in sight. Volunteers for the army had dried up but the government was determined to continue the war to a victorious conclusion. No peace negotiations were to be considered. To the generals and politicians, conscription, compulsory military service, seemed the only way to fill the gaps and strengthen the numbers enough to deliver a decisive blow. The government was dominated by liberals and many hesitated over conscription because, in theory at least, they cherished the liberties of British subjects against state power. Only in the direst emergency could they be persuaded to set aside the voluntary principle and compel their citizens to fight. So from the summer of 1915 through to January 1916 is often described as a process whereby Asquith managed expectations within the Liberal Party and within his government to the point where conscription was seen not only as inevitable, but acceptable. The inclusion of a conscience clause helped in getting the Military Service Act through Parliament, but it was fiercely contested by Conservatives and by the popular press, who saw it as a shirker's charter. It allowed men with, who expressed a conscientious objection to military service to appeal before the local military service tribunals and express that conscientious objection. Um, and the military service tribunal then had to decide what to do with that. Those appearing before tribunals initially expected that an expression of conscientious objection, should it be accepted by the tribunal, 
would give them absolute exemption from all military service. In other words, they could just turn up, say their piece, be told that, OK, that's all right, lad. You can go home and carry on with the rest of your life. The allowance for conscience meant that in Parliament, opposition to the Military Service Act melted away and only 36 MPs voted against the final reading of the bill. It became law by royal assent on the 27th of January 1916. At midnight on the 1st of March, all single men between the ages of 18 and 41 were deemed to be enlisted unless they had applied for exemption. Applications for exemption were heard by hastily appointed tribunals in every town and city in Britain. They included a military representative, and in almost every case, they were determined not to make any allowances for men they regarded as shirkers. Conditional and temporary exemptions were granted for all sorts of compassionate, occupational and medical reasons, but conscientious objectors were hardly ever exempted. You could appeal on grounds of domestic hardship, on illness and so on. And conscience came fairly well down the list. In fact, of all the uh, alphabetical letters applied to it, it was, it was letter F. The solution usually offered was that they could join a non-combatant corps of the army, labouring or shifting supplies, equipment and ammunition. But for most conscientious objectors, this wasn't acceptable, because they saw it as merely freeing up other men to do the fighting in their place. By the end of March 1916, hundreds had already been arrested, forcibly conscripted and, once in military custody, subjected to various punishments for refusing to wear uniform or obey orders. The No Conscription Fellowships National Convention of the 8th and 9th of April was convened as an emergency response. Some members were already in military custody. The delegates who gathered from all over Britain were determined to show solidarity and coordinate resistance. No Conscription Fellowship founders, Fenner Brockway and Clifford Allen, were billed to speak from the platform. Along with other radical and religious figures, including the feminist Helena Swanick and Labour MP Philip Snowden, who had been the conscientious objector's most tireless champion in Parliament. All the accounts we have describe a highly charged but remarkably disciplined atmosphere. The Quaker John William Graham was among the older associate NCF members who were there. Later to become the movement's official historian, his account is full of the infectious zeal of the moment. Earnest of face and tense of spirit, they met with the knowledge that the world held them in contempt and that persecution hung over them. But no one who was present could doubt that the spirit which animated them would one day conquer the world. The Daily Mail deplored the arrival of mild-faced creatures, mostly thinnish and large-eyed with rankish, untrimmed hair, and thin apostolic beards. And of those inside the hall, the pro-war Fabian, Beatrice Webb, was hardly more sympathetic. The entries to the hall were strongly but discreetly held. The assembly, which was presided over by Clifford Allen, was good-tempered and orderly. Allen was a monument of Christian patience and lucid speech. His spiritual countenance, fine gentle voice and quiet manner serving him well as the president of a gathering of would-be martyrs for the sacred cause of peace. Clifford Allen has a certain mad magnetism. Personally, I think it is doomed to failure. Every possible smear you could think to address to a conscience objector was trotted out in the columns of the newspapers of the time, Daily Mail, Daily Express and so on. Would-be intruders were kept out of the building by high iron gates at both entrances, through which delegates with tickets were only admitted one at a time. Here's the scene at a side entrance, almost certainly the incident described by the Manchester Guardian. Three sailors, sailors can climb anything, shinned over the barriers but went astray in the dark twisting passages of the hall. They were taken in hand by peace-loving stewards, and there was a friendly argument ending with handshakes all around. 
Other accounts refer to bags of flour being hurled at NCF stewards behind the gates, but their efforts evidently prevented any direct physical attack or injury. There doesn't seem to have been much attempt by the police to intervene. Towards the end of his speech, Alan was in danger of being drowned out by the bombardment of angry noise from outside through the open windows. So, to avoid further provoking the opposition, delegates in the severely overcrowded hall waved papers or handkerchiefs to show their approval. At the top of the agenda was the question of whether members should accept any alternative to competent service. Alan argued passionately for the absolutist position, that members should refuse all compromises that might in any way contribute to the war effort. Clifford Allen's absolute position was upheld in a carefully worded resolution without binding individual members who might decide to accept non-combatant military or alternative civilian service. The Convention reaffirms its deeply held belief in the sanctity of human life and declares its loyalty to the principles of peace and human fellowship. It therefore refuses to take part in war and further declares that it cannot accept any form of alternative service, the result of which would be the more efficient organising of the country for war. Similarly, whilst leaving the decision open to the conscientious judgment of each member, the Convention endorses the recommendation of the National Committee that all final certificates other than absolute exemption be returned. So the resolution was pretty uncompromising. But it did have that get-out clause, whilst leaving the decision open to the conscience of each individual member. Then there was a pledge that all the delegates stood to affirm before the close of the convention. We, representing thousands of men who cannot participate in warfare and are subject to the terms of the Military Service Act, unite in comradeship with those of our number who are already suffering for conscience sake in prison or the hands of the military. We appreciate the spirit of sacrifice which actuates those who are suffering on the battlefield and in that spirit we renew our determination, whatever the penalties awaiting us, to undertake no service which for us is wrong. We are confident that thus we are advancing the cause of peace and so rendering such service to our fellow men in all nations as will contribute to the healing of the wounds inflicted by war. Newly recruited to the NCF cause, Bertrand Russell was too old to be conscripted himself, but was at Devonshire House. The spirit of the young men was magnificent, vigorous, courageous, full of real religion, not hysterical at all, not seeking martyrdom, but accepting it with great willingness. I am convinced that at least half will not budge an inch for any power on earth. The harsh realities of physical and psychological duress, hardship and suffering lay ahead for those adopting the pledge, and the solidarity of the 1916 convention would often be recalled to sustain morale. More than 80 COs died as a direct result of their treatment by military and civilian authorities. Some were sent to France and sentenced to death, although not actually shot. So for the rest of the war, NCF members were scattered and often divided. Its offices were raided, printing presses confiscated, and supporters were tried, fined and imprisoned. In the circumstances, its capacity to continue activity, support its members and agitate on their behalf was incredible. Its weekly newspaper never missed an edition. Women, like Catherine Marshall, and older men like Bertrand Russell, kept the organisation going, but there would be no possibility of another national convention until after the war was over. When that gathering took place, also at Devonshire House, in November 1919, the NCF would be wound up with more speeches and with the appointment of some watchdog committees to continue its work against militarism. In his own speech to the 1919 convention, Clifford Allen laid aside the NCF divisions, declaring that all COs, absolutist and alternativist alike, had shattered the infallibility of militarism. <laughs>
Even at the time, this must surely have been heard more as a statement of unbroken optimistic resolve than one of established fact. Because what did the No Conscription Fellowship actually achieve? They certainly didn't stop the war. They didn't even stop conscription. And further wars would claim many millions of lives in the century ahead. But they established a principle that was to grow and greatly influence 20th century civil rights movements. And conscientious objection was gradually recognised in many other countries. Perhaps they also laid the foundations for peace movements that still continue, even if they suffer far more setbacks than victories. The World War I centenary has given us opportunities to reflect on this. The world of 1914 to 18 has vanished from living memory, but is still contested between various narratives seeking to define the place of World War I in our national story our national identity. Devonshire House in Bishopsgate is long demolished. No plaque marks the spot and no tourist guides stop to tell the story of what happened here in April 1916. But maybe the 2000 who met on that April weekend and the event itself deserve something more than their obscure footnote in British history.